Hi, I'm Jackie. Welcome to Abbey Health Club. Thanks. If you follow me, I'll give you a quick tour. Through there is the swimming pool. Oh, yes. It looks good. The pool's open all the time except for Thursday afternoons when it's closed for cleaning. I see. You can take classes in the pool if you like. We have swim for fitness classes on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays at 2pm and water aerobics on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the morning at 10. All classes are an hour. OK. And where is the gym? It's just up here. Wow. It's big. You can come here and exercise any time. There are lots of fitness classes. We've got aerobics, cycling, running, lots of things. How about yoga? Is there a yoga class? Sure. We have yoga for beginners on Mondays and Thursdays at 9.30 and intermediate yoga at 11.30 on Tuesdays and Fridays. Great! Oh, uh, and is there a car park? Yes, but you have to pay ah. about one pound for an hour, I think. We're open from six in the morning to ten at night, Monday to Friday, and on Saturday and Sunday from 8am to 9pm. So, do you want to join? Uh, how much is it? Well, there's a joining fee of £70 and then you can choose the type of membership you want. When do you think you'll be coming? Uh, evenings and weekends, I guess. Well, that's gold membership, so it'll be £50 a month. I see. Well, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. See you soon, maybe. Yes, maybe. Now, I'm going to tell you a story, and I swear every word of it is true. Three years ago, I started to feel very sick. I had terrible headaches. I felt tired all the time, and all my body ached. In the end, I went to hospital and had some tests. Well, when they told me the news, I couldn't believe it. They said I had a rare bone disease, and there was nothing they could do. They said that within just a few months, I would be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. Well, I decided I wouldn't give up without a fight. I've always been interested in alternative medicine. So when a friend told me about stories he'd heard of a kind of witch doctor in Indonesia who could work miracles, I decided to take a chance. I sold my house, said goodbye to my friends, and flew to Indonesia. When I got to Jakarta, I took a train and then two buses up into the mountains to this tiny village in the middle of nowhere. When I arrived, I asked people, Yang Yang? Yang Yang? That's the name of the witch doctor my friend told me about. Then a small boy, he must have been seven or eight, took my hand and led me out of the village and further up into the mountains. For two days we walked. I was in terrible pain the whole time, but I was determined to go on. Eventually, we reached a small hut, and I could see a strange man standing outside. He was short and covered in mud or something like that. He smiled and took me into his hut. I didn't say anything. He just seemed to know why I was there. Well... In the hut, it was really dark, but I could see lots of bowls all around, each full of some kind of herb or plant or something. He told me to lie down, and he put his hands on my head and started to sing. All of a sudden, I felt a great energy come into me. He did this for maybe half an hour, and then he gave me something to drink. I don't know what it was. It was a thick brown liquid, and it smelled awful, but I still drank it. Well, to cut a long story short, I stayed there for a week. Every day, 
the witch doctor did the same thing, and I drank the same liquid. After a week, the boy came back. I felt so good I almost ran back to Jakarta. When I got home, I went back to the same hospital and had the same tests, and guess what? The disease had completely gone. There was no sign of anything. They couldn't believe it. Like I say, that was three years ago. And here I am, still strong and healthy. Amazing. Hey, Bob. There's a health and fitness quiz in this magazine. Do you fancy having a go? No. There's a programme on TV I want to watch. Oh, go on. It won't take long. No. Question one. Do you eat at least five portions of fruit or vegetables every day? <sighs> yes. <laughs> you big liar. Hmm? I'll put rarely for hmm. that. Question two. Do you smoke? Smoke? <laughs> Pretty much all the time. Yes. You're like a chimney. Question three. Do you exercise at least three times a week? That's easy. Never. Question four. Do you take time to relax each day? Oh, the chance will be a fine thing. I'll put rarely. Question five. Do you eat fast food? I can't stand that rubbish. OK, never. Mm. Do you eat something healthy for breakfast? Well, I always have cereal and toast. OK. Question seven. Do you sleep seven to eight hours a night? Oh, yes, always. I've got to get my beauty sleep. Shame it's not working. Mm. Ha, ha. <laughs> Question eight. Do you drink at least a litre of water a day? A litre? No way. Unless I've had a curry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put rarely. OK, last few questions now. <sighs> Do you enjoy your hobbies and have a good social life? No hobbies, really. But I go out three or four times a week, so... Mm. I'll put sometimes for that. Mm. Next question. Do you feel stressed? Stressed? All the time. OK. Now, let's see what your score is. And welcome once again to People Today. Now it's time for our Eye on the World section with Mark Perkins. Mark? Thanks, Anna. Yes, in tonight's Eye on the World, we go to Japan. Now, everyone knows people in Japan work long, hard hours. But just what do people do in their free time? Well, we did a survey of leisure activities in Japan, and here is the top ten. In first place is eating out. As you can see, eating out is by far the most popular free time activity. In second place comes, wait for it, driving. Yes, it appears Japanese people like nothing more than driving around cities and into the countryside in their free time. It may seem strange to you and me, but there you are. Next, in third place, is travel within Japan. To all those lovely temples and gardens, I guess. Fourth is, guess what, Anna? I have no idea. Karaoke, of course. <laughs> Lots of people enjoy singing along with their favorite songs. Then, in fifth place, we have watching DVDs and videos, followed by listening to music. But just look what we have here in seventh place. Trips to museums and zoos. Then, way down in eighth place, comes going to bars, and after that, gardening. I guess not so many people in Japan have gardens. And finally, in 10th place, we have playing the lottery. 
And who wouldn't want to win lots of money? Back to you, Anna. Thanks, Mark. Now let's go to see what's happening. And now, with the time just coming up to one thirty here on Radio Four, it's time for you collect what? Welcome, welcome, listeners, to another exciting program of You Collect What. I'm Sandra Marshall, and this is the show where each week we ask a collector to talk about their unusual collection. But first, you have to guess what it is. Today's collector of strange and wonderful things is Jennifer Wilson. Now, Jennifer, can you tell us a little about your collection? Yes. I keep them all over my house. I have over one thousand altogether, and over one thousand. How big are they? Oh, they're fairly small, and they fold away easily. So I keep most of them in cupboards. And what do these mysterious things look like? Well, they are very colourful and beautiful to look at. They come in many different shapes. Some are in the shape of animals or people, or cartoon characters like Mickey Mouse. Are they different sizes too? No, they're all the same size. Hmm. And can you give us a clue about what they're used for? Well, you put them over something else, something very normal and boring, to make it look more interesting. Oh yes. Um, is whatever you put these things over something useful? Perhaps something you'd use every day. Yes, especially if you're sad or have a cold. Hmm. Well, thank you, Jennifer Wilson. Now, listeners, it's over to you. Do you mind if I sit here? No, not at all. Go ahead. Um, I'm James. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Lucy. Uh, what class are you doing? Advanced woodwork. Oh, that sounds good. Do you like it? It's okay, I guess. Only okay. It's a bit too hard for me, actually. I can't really understand what to do half the time. Oh dear. Why don't you change to an easier class? I think there's a beginners' woodwork class, isn't there? Yes, but I like the teacher, Mr. Benson. He says I just have to be more patient, so I'll try. How about you? I'm doing yoga. Nice. I bet that's fun. I love it. It's really relaxing. The teacher's from India, Mrs. Nara. Maybe you've seen her. She wears Indian clothes. Hmm. I think I remember reading something about a Mrs. Nara in.、Um... Oh, oh! Look at the time. I'd better go. My class starts at seven. Quick! You don't want to be late. Isn't yours starting too? No, mine's at seven thirty. Lucky you. Okay, James. See you later, maybe. Yeah. See you later, Lucy. Oh yes, I remember my first day at school, infant school that is. I remember feeling very proud when my mother walked with me through the main gate. There was so much noise and so many children that I got quite scared. Anyway, my mum took me to see the teacher. Mrs. Gossage was her name. Very nice teacher, and I remember feeling very nervous watching my mother leaving. But Mrs. Gossage looked after me, and she sat me down with the other pupils in a big circle. Soon we started playing games, so I got very excited. I think it was after lunch that I met Emily, who later became my best friend. She was in another class, but all the new students were brought together to meet each other. And anyway, this was when I met Emily. I was so relieved to have a friend. 
Oh, yes, and in the afternoon we went swimming. But I couldn't swim, so I became very upset and started to cry. In fact, I wouldn't stop crying, so Mrs Gossage phoned my mother and she came to collect me early. I remember feeling very confused when I saw my mum. So much had happened. We went and had an ice cream and then I felt calm again. But what a day. I'll never forget it. Well, in Simon's final year at primary school, Charles and I visited the local secondary schools to find a good one for him and, well, let's just say we were less than impressed. Terrible. They were absolutely dreadful. I mean, in St James's, there were 42 pupils in a class and in Nuffield College, the teachers we saw knew less than the kids they were supposed to teach. And what about Halliwell Community College? Oh, don't remind me. Oh, it was so (laughs) rough. There was no discipline and the children seemed to be uncontrolled. Shocking. That's why we decided to teach Simon at home. Yes. Before I married, I was a teacher, so I'm qualified. And when we found out what was involved, it seemed the obvious thing to do. Yes, the Home Education Advisory Service were absolutely wonderful. They gave us all the help we needed. We decide what Simon learns, how and when. He still takes all the normal exams, though. And his results are very good now. And he used to be so unhappy at school. Mm. He was always saying he didn't want to go. It's the best thing we could possibly have done as parents. You feel very proud when you see your son become more confident, mature, responsible. and We're already uh, thinking about sending him to Cambridge to study. When my parents took me out of school and told me they were going to teach me at home, I thought they were mad. I mean, all my friends were there. But that's a year ago now, and it feels like such a long time. I love homeschooling now. Other kids have to get up early and go to school. Sometimes it takes them over an hour just to get there. But me, I don't have to travel to school. I can stay in bed. All I have to do is go downstairs. And there's no stupid uniform to wear either and better food for lunch. I think I enjoy studying more because my mum knows what I like and how I learn best. My grades are better anyway, so something must be working. I see more of my parents than I would if I was at school, so I think I'm closer to them, especially my mum, than other kids who go to school all day. When other kids ask me, what school do you go to? And I say, I don't go to school. They think I'm sad and, like, deprived or something. Some think my parents must be religious nuts or, like, really controlling, but they're not. Thousands of children are taught at home in this country. No one realises that. Anyway, I think I'm really lucky, and I know my parents want the best for me. Come in. Hello. Yes. Take a seat. Now, you are... Tom. Tom Baker. Tom Baker. Okay. My name is Kevin Bird, Tom, and I'm going to interview you today. Hi. Now then, how old are you, Tom? Nineteen. Okay. And what job are you applying for? Waiter. Just a normal waiter. Okay. Now, we have two shifts. That's 7 to 3 or 3 to 11 in the evening. Do you have any preference? No, I don't mind. But I can only work Saturday and Sunday. That's okay, Tom. Saturday and Sunday are our busiest days. Are you available from next Saturday? Sure. That's the 18th, right? Yes. Saturday the 18th. Great. But first, (laughs) can you tell me if you have any experience? Our standards are pretty high here at the Happy Chicken. Well, last summer, I worked for McDonald's. 
for three months. Right. How about as a waiter, though? Oh, I worked over New Year in a local restaurant near my parents' home. Oh yes. And did you enjoy it? Sure. It was okay. I speak Spanish, and there were lots of Spanish tourists, so I got good tips. Great. So you speak Spanish. Excellent. Well, there are still some other candidates. So can you just give me your phone number, and I'll be in touch. Yes, it's five five nine three zero four. Five five nine three zero four. Okay. Oh, when is the best time to contact you? Evenings between five and eight, I think. Fine. Well, thanks very much for coming, Tom. See you again. Thank you, Mr. Bird. Call me Kevin. Oh, thanks. Bye then. Hi, Barry. How's things? Oh, not so good. How come? What's the matter? I hate my new job. It really gets me down. Oh, too bad. Yeah. Every morning I have to get up at six o'clock. Six o'clock. That's a real bad start to the day. I used to get up at ten or later. Hmm. And there's no bus at that time, so I have to cycle five miles to get to work. It's cold and rainy every day. Yes. The weather's pretty bad at the moment. When I get to work, I have to make the boss a cup of coffee. I mean, can't he get his own coffee? I feel like a servant. Hmm. And when I start work, it's the same thing all the time. Just answering the phone to hear people complain and complain. All、oh, right, you're in customer services, aren't you? Yeah, customer disservices, more like. The things those salespeople tell them, really. Listening to all these customers moaning over the phone, I tell you, it makes me depressed. So I see. Well, at least you get a free lunch. <laughs> you mean used to? Now we have to pay. That's another problem. It costs me around a fiver just to eat, and that's more than I get paid for an hour's work. I'm losing money. Well. At least you finish work early. Yeah, but when I get home around four, I'm too tired to do anything. My social life is zero right now. <sighs> Why don't you quit then? Quit? Are you mad? It's the best job I've had. Well. I'm standing on the shop floor here at Grundy Electronics, one of Manchester's most advanced electrical component manufacturers, and I'm here because, well, the managers here have come up with a rather novel way to boost productivity. I'm joined by John Faircastle, who is head of human resources. John, can you tell the viewers exactly what this extraordinary plan is? Of course. Well, we recently hired a feng shui expert to come to the factory and basically redesign everything from the managing director's office to the factory floor where we are now. Wow! Can you explain to viewers what a feng shui expert is or does? Well, feng shui is the ancient art of balancing different energies and forces to make a more harmonious environment. We believe that by positioning certain things in certain ways, using feng shui, we can create positive working conditions. Sounds confusing. Not really. It simply means balancing the five essential elements of water, wood, fire, earth, and metal. So, how does that work in a place like this, John? Well, water helps with relaxation and fight stress. So, we placed water dispensers throughout the building. And outside, you may have noticed the pond we installed in the centre of the car park with the fountain in. That's right.、Um, then there's wood. Wood helps with creativity and flexibility. So we put all wooden furniture in the offices and wooden flooring too. Right. But what about fire? You can't have fire in an office, can you? That'd be dangerous. <laughs> well, the fire element is good for originality and enthusiasm. 
The colour red represents the fire element, so we have red walls everywhere. And all the pictures have red picture frames too. I see. And earth? What's that good for? The earth element helps organisation and stability. We use bricks to channel this energy, so that's why you see so many brick walls. Plus, of course, the earth-coloured tiles in the bathrooms. OK, that's clever. There's one more element to balance, isn't there? What's that again? Metal. Metal helps strength and determination. Ah. We have metal filing cabinets and metal blinds in every office. Wow. And have any of these changes made a difference? Well, in the three months since the changes were made, we have lost 20% fewer days through sickness. So your employees are healthier? That seems to be the case. Certainly, they come to work more often. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it. Proof, if any were needed, that the 5,000-year-old art of feng shui is alive and well here in Manchester. Now, back to the studio. Hi, Brian. What are you doing? I'm just trying to work out how much I spend a month. Oh, that's why you look so sad. It's terrible. I spend about £30 a month just on books. Oh, that's a lot. And my rent is £50 a week. So that's another £200 a month. Oh, yeah, rent's a killer. Then there's food. About £30 a week on that. So that's 120 just to eat every month. Yes, but what about going out and stuff? That costs me a fortune. Me too. I think about £150 a month and another 50 on eating out. Mm. Oh, guess what? I heard the bus fares are going up. Oh, great. Mm. It already costs me £7 a week just to get to college and back. That's £28 on transport already. What's that in the bag? CDs. I bought two this morning in town. <laughs> so don't complain to me about having no money then. Hey, I like music. Anyway, I only buy about two a month, so it doesn't cost more than, say, £20. Mm, still. It's not easy making ends meet, you know. Look at these jeans. Look. I need a new pair. So buy some. I've already spent £50 on clothes this month. And that's my limit. Well, my parents sent me some money this morning, so I'm off shopping. I need a new dress. Parents, eh? Now there's an idea. OK, people, let's do this thing. Now, turn the page. Go on, turn the page. What do we have here? I'll tell you what we have here. The most important part of this whole talk, that's what we have here. If you only take one thing from today, let it be this. Read the top. Read it. What does it say? It says, sell your way to success. That's right. It's all about selling. You know the product, but can you sell it? Can you sell it? Well, let's learn how. Step one, get their attention. Get their attention. Vital. And how do you do that? As soon as they open the door, smile. Give a big smile. Always smile. I want to see you people smiling. Come on, smile. <laughs> Good. That's rule one. Rule two, get straight to the point. Say who you are and what you have for them. Hi, I'm Brad Winner, and I've got something special for you today. Now, quick, move on. Step two, get their interest. Start by saying you're doing a survey and you want their opinion. That makes them feel valued. Ask them a couple of questions. Then 
show them the product. Show them the product as soon as you can. When they see it, the link is made. Finally, tell them it's free if they let you demonstrate it. That's right. Say it's theirs to keep, whatever, but get inside so you can demonstrate it. Step three. Come on, people, keep up. Step three. Get their desire. Their desire. Make them want it. Tell them about the advantages of the product. Why it's the best thing in their sad little lives. <laughs> and then, here's the key. Give it to them. Give it to them so they can hold it. Bang! Another link is made. You see? Now, step four, the most important part. Mm -hmm. Get their money. Money, people! That's what this is all about. How do you get their money? Easy. Trick one, go for their sympathy. Tell them you're working your way through college or it's your first day. Something, anything, but get their sympathy. Trick two, make them feel guilty. Say that their kid deserves this. Every good parent would want one. Trick three, give them a free offer. Buy one, get a second free, a free offer. How can they refuse? Use as many tricks as you like, but be sure of one thing. Never leave without a sale. That's our golden rule, people. Never leave without a sale. Now, over the page. Go on. Turn the page. Don't buy that, Jane. It's a waste of money. <sighs> Don't talk to me about wasting money, Rodney. You're an expert at it. No, I'm not. I've no idea what you mean. How about that barbecue you bought last summer? I thought it would be nice to have parties in the garden. We've only used it once. You spent over 300 pounds on it. Well, it's too complicated. Anyway, you can't talk. What about those boots of yours? The ones you got on holiday last Christmas? You said you needed them for going out, but I've never seen you in them once. They don't fit me. Well, it was a bit stupid to buy them then, just because you fancied the shop assistant. Ah, I did not fancy him, actually, Rodney. He was just being helpful, that's all. Sure. How much did they cost? About £200. <laughs> that's still less than your stupid barbecue. Oh, shut up, Jane. You're boring. Simon, where are those sunglasses of yours? I gave them to Mark. But you only got them in July. I've never even seen you wear them. How much were they? Fifty quid. No, they weren't. They were more like a hundred and fifty. Why did you buy them if you were never going to wear them? I thought they'd make me look cool. But you said they made me look like a fly. Well, they did. What a waste. You look like a fly anyway. Thanks. At least I'm not the one who's spent a fortune on a computer I never used. What? Oh, stop going on about that, will you? I thought I needed it for work. Right. You got it in February, and all you did was play a game on it and then sell it in April for a loss. Oh, give it a rest. You paid about £1,000, didn't you, and sold it for 600 after just two months. Well, work gave me one, so I didn't need it. Mm, pity you didn't check first, isn't it, Kate? Right, that's it. I am sick of your criticism, Simon. We are finished. Well, in 1999, I lived in Portugal, and one day I saw this computer in a second-hand shop. Mm. Yeah. So, because I didn't have a computer, and this was very cheap, I bought it. Mm, why not? Right. There was no box, but I didn't think it was important. Anyway, when it was time to leave Portugal and return to Britain, I packed all my bags, but of course there was no box for this computer. Yeah, that's uh -oh. difficult. yeah. I didn't know what to do. Then, in the local market, I saw lots of wooden boxes. 
you know, for fruit and vegetables and things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I picked one up thinking, this is perfect. <laughs> Well, no, you see, because suddenly a very angry man came up and started shouting at me. Oh, why? <laughs> He owned the boxes and told me I had to pay. Oh. Well, I paid, of course, and that was that. All right. Well, when I got to the airport, I was a bit worried. I thought that maybe I had too much luggage. <laughs> sure enough, at check in, they told me that I had too much luggage and I had to pay extra for the computer. Oh, You're no. joking. Yeah. They told me to take it to the excess baggage section in another part of the airport. When I got there, they weighed it and told me I was 15 kilos overweight <laughs> and that I had to pay 40 pounds a kilo. Oh, what? Don't believe that it. was 600 pounds. Oh, oh no. that's ridiculous. Oh. I became very angry, of course and we had a discussion. <laughs> Imagine. Eventually, I paid £280, oh, which was more than I paid for the computer itself. <laughs> <laughs> and when I collected my bags at Heathrow Airport, the computer and the box were all broken. OK, that's the end of the class. Don't forget your homework for tomorrow. Wow, I like that ghost story. Do you think it's true? Oh, no, uh, I don't think so. It's just in a book. Let's ask him. Do you believe in ghosts, Martin? Oh, uh, well, uh, I did have a strange experience once. Really? Yes, about seven years ago. A friend of mine and I were sitting in my grandmother's lounge, talking. Oh, yes? yes? My grandmother has a big old house near London, and anyway, she was in the garden, and my friend and I were in the lounge, and suddenly we heard a noise upstairs. Oh. It wasn't a big noise. We thought maybe a mouse or something. Anyway, we went upstairs, and... It seemed to be coming from my grandmother's bedroom. D did you go in? Yes. We went inside and, well, it was amazing, really. All the furniture in my grandmother's bedroom was on the left side of the room and the carpet was neatly rolled up on the other side of the room. And this furniture is really heavy. A very heavy wardrobe, chest of drawers, bed... These things would take four men to lift. It was really scary. <sighs> and all we heard was a tiny noise for no more than around a minute. My grandmother said it happened once before, too. The really scary thing is, she didn't seem to mind. One. Oh, yes. It was in late July 2002. I had just left college and I felt fantastic. I was young, healthy. I had the whole world at my feet. No more exams. I swore I'd never take another exam. I was making plans to go abroad, see some of the world. I felt so free. I used to meet my friends from college in the evenings and we'd talk about all our plans. Two. Um, about two years ago. That was when I set up my own pizza delivery company. I was really optimistic and felt sure that things were going to go great. I had contracts with three big pizza restaurants and had just employed six delivery staff. I was so proud. Three. The best day of my life was on September the 1st, 2000. It was around 8.30 at night. I was in a restaurant with Maria, my girlfriend at the time, and I had just asked her to marry me. She said yes. I felt so relieved. We ordered champagne, and I was absolutely elated. Four. Oh, yes, that's easy. Three months ago. My beautiful baby Jason was born then. He has the most marvelous blue eyes and blonde hair. I was exhausted, 
My husband was with me, and he filmed everything on our camcorder. It was an unforgettable experience, and I remember feeling very... <laughs> different. I was a mother now. Five. For me, it was probably on holiday last year in Brazil. I went to the Rio Carnival. It was absolutely amazing. There were tens of thousands of people all just having a good time. I was so excited. The music played all day and night. I did the samba until my feet ached so much I could hardly stand up. I was so tired by the end. What an amazing party. I mean, just out of this world. And now, with the time just coming up to 3 o'clock here on Radio 4, it's Science Today. Hello and welcome to Science Today. My name is Clive Wilson. For today's programme, I have come to the South Australian desert to find out about an exciting new type of engine, the scramjet. Just yesterday, the scientists here successfully sent a rocket 200 miles up into the air. Now, maybe you think that's not so special, but this rocket had a special engine, what's called a scramjet engine that breathes air. During this test, it travelled at seven times the speed of sound. Now that's fast. That means that a journey from London to Sydney, for example, which now takes 20 hours, could take just two hours. To help us understand the science behind all this, here is Dr. Simon Green, the chief scientist. Dr. Green, tell us more. Yes, well, uh, this engine works by using the oxygen in the air to burn the fuel, but it can only do this at very high speeds. You see, when the... Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Space Society. To live in the 21st century is to live in an age where communication and technology seem to rule our world. And almost inevitably, we find ourselves thinking about human settlement of other planets. Tonight, the topic of our debate is the colonization of other planets. Here with us, we have Dr. Timothy Brown and Dr. Sandra Wilkins. Dr. Brown, may I ask you to speak first? Thank you. Let me start by making one thing clear. Colonization of other planets is certain. It's only a matter of time. Oh, and of course, money. To build a spaceship capable of carrying hundreds of people is not cheap. However, once built, all a spaceship needs is enough fuel, food, water, and oxygen, and colonization becomes a reality. I see three steps to colonization. First, we need to know how to live in space. And, thanks to the International Space Station, this step is already achieved. The next logical step is to establish a colony on the moon, and then step three on Mars, our nearest planet. Imagine how much we can discover about a planet by living there. Imagine also if we set up powerful telescopes on the moon or Mars, how much more we can learn about the universe. It is mankind's destiny to colonize other planets. We must not fail in this challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And now, may I ask Dr. Sandra Wilkins to speak? Thank you. And thank you to Dr. Brown for that interesting speech. I am glad the good doctor referred to money. Just think for a moment how much money colonization of the moon or Mars or any other planet would take. 
billions and billions and billions of dollars to put a handful of people on a dead planet. The fact is, colonization is just too expensive. People may talk of huge resources of copper, diamonds, and other precious minerals on other planets, but no one knows they are there. We should spend the money on this planet, on feeding people and protecting Earth's environment, rather than make foolish and costly trips into space. Many thanks, Dr. Wilkins. And now, are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. Could I? Um, I have a question. Yes, the lady over there. Thank you for coming, everyone. As you know, it is our job here at Future Design Technologies to predict market trends before they happen. This forward thinking allows us to advise our clients so they can be first on the market. Now, today's presentation will show how we see the development of the motor car in the short to medium term. And that is why we've invited all of you here today. Let's start with power. It's clear that petrol-driven engines have no future. Already there are many AFVs. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, that means alternative fuel vehicles on the market, powered by anything from propane to solar power to natural gas. In fact, as long ago as the 1930s, vehicles were running on natural gas. Some independent thinkers have even produced cars that run on vegetable oil. <laughs> but, as we all know, of all these alternative fuel vehicles, the most practical are EVs, or electric vehicles. Sure, in the past, EVs had their problems, namely a limited driving range and very few recharging points, which limited their use. Now, however, recent developments in EV technology mean they can match conventional petrol engines in terms of performance and safety. Let's not forget that EVs are cleaner. They are, in fact, zero emissions vehicles. Plus, importantly, the power source is rechargeable, so this does not involve using any valuable resources. Now, the really exciting thing is this. The fuel cell. Looks like a skateboard, doesn't it? Really, it's just a battery, but it's contained in the vehicle chassis. The area where the engine would normally be is free, so you have far more space. The design options for the vehicle interior are huge. Moving on to communications. Very soon, cars will have their own navigation system. They will be linked to GPS satellites, so they'll do all the driving for you. What controls remain for the occupants will be audio-based. So, for example, you'll just have to say, a bit warmer, and the air conditioning will adjust automatically. You'll also be able to receive email, music, and movies, all via an internet link. So, just tap in the destination you want, sit back, sleep, Watch a movie, whatever. All that extra space where the engine was can be like a lounge. All the chairs can face each other. What about car crashes? Aha! Lasers and radar sensors will track nearby cars, so you'll never crash. It'll be perfectly safe. Now, that's the end of the introduction. Hey, John, get the post, will you? OK. Anything interesting? Uh, a few bills and... Uh, oh, a leaflet on recycling. Oh, really? It's about time we started recycling. What does it say? Recycling information 
as part of the city's campaign to protect the environment, we are introducing a recycling scheme. Please use the black bin for all recyclable waste. Oh, they must mean that bin we got a couple of weeks ago. I wondered what it was for. It says here the collection for North Park is on Mondays. How about Mum? Let's look.、Uh, south, South. Ah, South Park is on Thursdays. They say we have to put it outside by seven o'clock in the morning. Hmm. So, what do we put in it?、Uh, it says here: newspapers, magazines, junk mail, white paper, cans, and aerosols. Pretty much everything, I think. Oh, hang on. No cardboard, milk cartons, plastic bags, or paint cans. Oh, and glass is different. Glass is on Tuesdays. No broken glass, it says. Well, what do we do with broken glass then? Well, I guess we have to take it to a recycling centre ourselves. Why can't they collect it? Maybe it's dangerous. Anyway, it says there are forty recycling centres here. I've never seen one. Where are they all? Well, there's a number here to call and ask. O one six two three. Nine eight seven four two six. I might give them a ring and ask. Yes, good idea. Ask them if there's anywhere to recycle old husbands too, will you? Ha <laughs> ha! Very funny. <laughs> please, please, can you help me? Someone just stole my camera. Now then, sir, calm down. Where did this happen? In the city centre, outside McDonald's. Would you like to report this to the crime management unit, sir? What's that? That's a special unit we have here that deals with this type of thing. They'll take some more details from you and give you a crime reference number for your insurance. Oh yes, let's do that then. This way, please, sir. Now, I'm Constable Martin Peel. I just need a few details from you, and then we can give you your crime reference number. Okay? Yes, fine. So your name is Manolo Gonzalez from Spain. Uh, that's um, M A N O L O, then、uh, G O N Z A L E Z. Okay, Manolo. And where are you staying here in London? I am a student. I'm staying with a host family. They are Mr. and Mrs. Hilton. The address is 23 Brookfield Close.、Oh, uh, hold on,、uh, 23 Brookfield Close. Yes. London, E12, 5TR. 5TR. Okay. Now you had a camera stolen. Yes. It was a digital camera, a Pentax DF Super. Color black. And how much was it worth? I only bought it last month. It cost three hundred and eighty euros. Right. Now you say it was stolen in the city centre outside McDonald's in Hope Avenue.、Uh, what time was this, sir?、Uh, about two thirty. And did you get a look at whoever stole it? He was a young man, maybe around eighteen, with short dark hair and glasses. He was wearing jeans and a green T-shirt. And、uh, were there any witnesses? Lots of people were there, but oh, the ice cream seller! He was standing on the corner. Okay, an ice cream seller. Now I'm going to give you a crime reference number, so write it down. It's. E F O one seven six three eight. Got it? Yes. Okay. Well, Mr. Gonzalez, that's all we can do for now. We'll contact you if we have any news. Okay then. Thank you very much. Sick of shopping now. These bags are too heavy. Yeah, let's go home. Oh no! Here we go again. 
Can you spare any change, sir? For the homeless? No, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. Here you are. Thanks, love. Have a nice day. You mustn't give those people any money, Diane. Why not? I think we should help people who can't help themselves. It can't be easy living on the streets. If they're homeless, it's because they want to be. There are plenty of hostels and places they can stay. Oh, what would you think if you had no money and saw people like us with loads of shopping bags walking past all day ignoring you? How would you feel? They get plenty of money off the government. Oh, really? Yes. They spend the money they get from begging on drugs and alcohol. That's the only reason they ask for more, and mugs like you give it to them. I don't think it's that simple, Charles. Many beggars have mental problems like depression. And anyway, living that kind of life, no wonder they start drinking and taking drugs. <laughs> he was only, what, mid-twenties? Perfectly fit. He could get a job today if he wanted. Oh. When I was his age, I had a job. I was working for my money, not begging for it. But people like him, they could easily get a job if they wanted one. The fact is, they know they can have a perfectly cushy life thanks to the government and people like you. Cushy? I wouldn't call that kind of life cushy. Whatever the reason for it, people who beg on the streets have a hard life. Anyway, I don't like talking about this kind of thing. Let's just forget it. 